From advertising to software as a service to data. Across all of our programs and clients, we've seen a 55 to 65 percent open rate. Getting brands authentically integrated into content performs better than TV advertising. Typical lifespan of an article is about 24 to 36 hours. If we're reaching out to the right person with the right message and a clear call to action, then it's just a matter of timing. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast, a Ben J. Shap LLC production. In this podcast, you'll hear the stories of world-class marketers that use technology to drive business results and achieve career success. We'll unearth the real-world experiences of some of the brightest minds in the marketing and technology space so you can learn the tools, tips, and tricks they've learned along the way. Now here's the host of the MarTech Podcast, Benjamin Shapiro. Welcome back to the MarTech Podcast. Today, we're going to dive deep into a marketing channel that is making a comeback in the digital age, direct marketing. Joining us is Ron Jacobs, who is the president of Jacobs & Clevenger, which is an independent creative communications firm rooted in strategy, technology, empowered and fixated on developing great user experiences that enable customer decisions. Outside of his role at Jacobs & Clevenger, Ron is also the author of the book, Successful Direct Marketing Methods, which is on its eighth edition. Yesterday, Ron told us a little bit about his view of the role that direct marketing should play in your marketing mix. And today, we're going to discuss tactics that you need to know for optimizing your direct marketing campaigns. Here's our interview with Ron Jacobs, president of Jacobs and Clevenger. Ron, welcome back to the MarTech Podcast. Thank you, Ben. Great to have you here in our episode yesterday. We bounced around a fair amount talking about what direct marketing is and the difference between direct response marketing and brand marketing. And we got into some of the tactics about how to use email versus direct mail and some channels. Today, I want to talk a little bit about optimizing direct marketing campaigns. So you mentioned that you've made the shift from traditional marketing methods towards using a CRM to understand when a trigger in marketing is happening and figuring out what the channel that you should use based on the marketing objective you're trying to achieve. Tell me a little bit about your optimization strategy now that you have so much data available to you. Well, I think one of the problems we all face, and you just described it pretty well, is that we have small data and we have big data and we have all these wonderful analytic capabilities, which are fast, efficient, and affordable. But we have so much data that I think marketers oftentimes get intoxicated by it. They see the data, but they can't really see the signal from the noise. And they try to optimize things that maybe can't be optimized or they try to make decisions when they're not quite ready to make those. So as a marketer, we spend a lot of time with clients simply going through the data that they have and trying to identify the optimal data to optimize. So you brought up a couple of points that I think are interesting. First is the difference between big data and small data And I actually want to coin the term small data. I'm going to steal this from you because instantly the second you said it, I thought about running my business and I've run this podcast purely using small data. The few people that I already know very closely in my network, reaching out to them to build a podcast audience. It is not a mass amount of data. It is not collecting user behavior across a ton. It is a very small amount of data that I'm able to optimize, but know very intimately. Tell me about how you think about where to use what we're calling small data and where big data is applicable. Let's go to the big data side because big enterprises have big data and they need big capabilities to basically sort through all that data. Most smaller firms, however, we have much smaller needs. We should take the data we have and not worry that we don't have enough data. The fact is, even most small firms, and by small firms, I mean small, mid-sized businesses, as well as enterprises that are smaller, we all have too much data. And the problem isn't getting more data. The problem is figuring out which pieces of that data actually are the ones that indicate things that are projectable, that we can use for predictive analytics or other kinds of algorithms that will help us to actually figure out what is working and what isn't working in our business. 
The irony is that if you're not working at Apple, Google, Facebook, Netflix, Microsoft, big data, the true meaning of big data is probably pretty irrelevant to your business. And let's throw in Salesforce and some other B2B players as well. The goal that most marketers are facing is taking your big data and making it small, figuring out what the actionable insights are, not looking at these macro trends across huge data sets. Right. And I think for most marketers, they look at it and they'd feel like if we just had one more piece of data, everything would be fine. If we could just figure out this one connection, we would be able to solve the problem. When in fact, the key to the problem is often locked up in the data that they already have. They're just not using it well enough. So talk to me about the optimization tactics and the use of data going from when you have a mass amount of data and getting conclusions from it. Behavior is something that I feel very strongly about tracking. So I know that most behaviors are things that I can predict from. Things that I can't predict from are all these ideas that we see. Intent. I love intent, but intent is hard to project from. I can't build a predictive model based on what I think someone intends to do. So when I look at it, well, they're in market. That's great, but that doesn't help me. So I've got to go back to the rudimentary data that I have that is behaviorally oriented and predict from that. So I'm going to cut through the data and I'm going to say, here's someone who spent a lot of time on my website. Is that the key data point for me? I then go to the end and look at what people actually did who purchased and go back and actually start to see what did they do? Were they all people who had a lot of dwell time on the website? If not, then maybe that isn't the right predictor. Algorithms are wonderful things because algorithms sort of cut through what I think and what you think and frankly, what my clients think and actually pull to the surface the things that work. So I like to use a lot of predictive analytics in my work because I think that probably takes a lot of the biases we have out of the decision making. So essentially, you're saying you're profiling the people that have been your converted customers, and you're looking at what some of the similar trends are there to understand what the KPIs are across each funnel. And you said that you're using algorithms to try to understand what those key performance metrics are. There's a lot of marketers that are not technical marketers, right, who are not writing the codes for their website. How do they put their algorithms together? That seems like something that's intimidating for people that aren't mathematicians and data scientists. Talk to me a little bit about putting algorithms together. I don't have a data scientist on my payroll. I've got about 30 people that work for us, and not one of them is a data scientist. But every one of them knows how to use data, whether they're a writer, an artist, or an account person. They all understand the rudimentary aspects of data. So I don't want people to be intimidated by the word algorithm. Algorithms are simply little strings of calculations that help us do the work that we have to in segmenting, in identifying what works and what doesn't work. So I look at this as something that shouldn't be a barrier. Mm -hmm. I can't decide how I feel about data science right now. I love it because I do build a lot of models and I do need a data scientist to build the model. So I'll use somebody on the outside to actually build the model. But to look at the data and understand the data, I don't think you need to be a data scientist to do that. I think that's one of the skills every marketer should have today. We struggle to identify everything from the skills and the tasks and the expertise we need to solve just the basic everyday problems that we have. So data to me has become second nature to my business. It's become second nature to something that I have to do. I don't care about personal data. I don't care who it is that did something. I care much more about what they did. And if I can start to unlock what people have done, I can go out and create more of them. And that's kind of the philosophy that we use. It's a pretty straightforward philosophy. It's not very complicated. Here's the thing that impresses me the most about you, Ron. We're just getting to know each other. We met on LinkedIn. Somebody on your team reached out and said that you would be a good candidate. You've been marketing and you come from a more of a traditional marketing background. While it was direct response, like you were doing marketing when it was sending mail and you get very little data in return. And your approach 
is a data-driven approach. And maybe it's just me being inexperienced or immature, but I think of someone with your level of experience not having the understanding of the use of data. You know, I think of that as a relatively new trend. And you are a sophisticated marketer in the sense of how you think about the use of data. Sure, you're hiring a data scientist to go build your algorithm, but that seems like a new practice and you are an experienced marketer. So how did you build that capability? The very first client I had years and years ago, and this is 1982 when I started my firm, had a problem. They were an organization that was in timesharing. They were the exchange network for people who own timeshared condominiums. And they came at me with this problem, which was, well, we can't renew people. Well, how do you sell to them is what I asked. And what I learned is people buy a timeshare and they get the membership for free. And now you're trying to convert them. I just started to logic out what the problem was with these customers. And the problem was pretty simple when I logicked it out. And I think of that as how I look at business and how I taught myself to do some of the things that I do today. Mm -hmm. I logic things out. I just look at what a problem is for the simplest way I can. I try not to overcomplicate it. When I go back to that experience, think about that. They get the membership free and now you're having trouble getting money from them to buy it. Yeah, of course you are. So now we have to figure out how to solve that problem. And I think a lot of marketers try to solve the wrong problems. We try to optimize the wrong things. We try to make it much more complicated than it actually is. And rather than thinking of my own mind as being a sophisticated, smart guy kind of mind, I think of my mind as very simple. I just try to logic everything out from the back to the front. And I kind of mentioned that yesterday in our other conversation. Oftentimes, my starting point isn't at the beginning. My starting point is at the end, and I work backwards to figure out how to get forward. I appreciate your way of thinking to solve the problem and your ability to simplify. And I totally agree that that is one of the biggest challenges facing marketers. And anybody that I've sort of coached as a marketer that reached out through the podcast looking to learn more about marketing, I tell them that my goal for this podcast is to simplify as much as what the experts in our field understand so it can be accessible. And at the end of the day, there is so much data and so many variables and so many moving parts for marketers these days that the more you can find one problem and try to solve it at a time, I feel like the better off you're going to be. What advice do you have for marketers that are getting into the field, looking to leverage data or somebody that's just feeling overwhelmed with solving a problem? Tell me a little bit more about your approach for using data to simplify and solve a problem. Well. My approach is to arm myself with as many skill sets as I can that are current. When I started working in data, there was no way to access data the way we can do it today. Again, I had a client that was in the data business, and this is sort of what really sent my vision of data down a great path. I ended up having a half a dozen of the largest data companies as my own client, Again, that approach of simplifying things helped me to understand their businesses in a way that they didn't even understand their businesses. So I think my best advice to people is try to think of things in a way that you can arm yourself with the current skill sets, whether it's customer experience or customer journey mapping or data science metrics or the ability to interact with technology. Try to understand it, not in a way that makes your mind fuzzy and cloudy and fills your mind with a lot of things that are hard to understand, but fills your mind with just the simple rudimentary things. Here's what this does. I have a problem. How do I solve it? How do I find a technology that will do that? I think that was my initial approach to data was to say, it's just data. How many points of data can we possibly make use of? A hundred points? That seems overwhelming. 50 points? That still seems overwhelming. At a point where I started to take data and break it up into these little pieces, I started to say, look, maybe five or 10 data points are all we can really deal with as humans. 
which are the ones that really make the most sense and how do I find the two or three that make the most sense? That's how I started thinking about data in the beginning. That served me pretty well to now. Yeah, I think that the more that you can simplify and the more that you could focus on smaller discrete problems that require very few data points and then layer on the findings and your knowledge on top of each other, that's where you have this need for large complex data sets. It builds to be large and complex over time. It should start very simple. Yeah, I think when I talk to new prospects, one of the things I often find when I speak with them is that they haven't defined their problem even. They want to sell more stuff. That doesn't help a marketer very much because everyone wants to sell more stuff. So let's find out what the real problem is. Why aren't you selling more stuff? And I think peeling that onion back and simplifying it to its base points is actually how you get closer and closer to solutions. So Ron, last question for you. We bounced around a fair amount talking about optimization and how to interpret data to understand what activities to take. Just in general, when you think about marketing and and your approach and how it's changed over time, what are the skills that you think marketers, the core skills you think marketers need to have to be able to be effective in direct response marketing today? Well, I mentioned data and it's not just data science, it's just data and analytics. Metrics, understanding KPIs and the math that goes around them, understanding how to do clicks, conversions, testing, those basic ideas. Storytelling. Storytelling has become a really important thing. We all need to understand that better because there's this logic and emotion thing in marketing. Direct marketers are really logic driven. That's why so much of our direct mail looks like a yard sale. But brand advertisers, they think more about the emotional side. Somehow we have to bring those two ideas together. And I think storytelling, whether it's a data story or a marketing story, that's an important thing. Content marketing, I think everybody has to understand more today about content and content marketing, because I think that's a real key to a lot of what we're doing. Marketers just think of content as being content. Well, I think it's a lot more than that. Data visualization, that's another point. I think we all, rows and columns of data are just not easily shareable, but data delivered using infographics and other kinds of things, this is how we really can communicate business intelligence. I think there's maybe two or three more things that just on a business level, we really need. We need that ability to make decisions. Decision-making has to be learned, practiced, and improved because failure is an option. And I don't want people to worry about testing and failing. Worry about testing and learning and analyzing what decisions you've actually made. And I think probably the last really important one is the need for collaboration. I don't know everything. And I walk into a lot of rooms where someone's always the smartest person in the room. And they let you know that. And for me, that doesn't really work very well. I don't think I'm the smartest person in the room, and I don't think anyone else should feel that way either. So I think to be successful today, you got to break down some of those silos. You've got to connect. And today, people work best when they're working all for common goals. Ron, I have to say, I appreciate the approach, and I appreciate how you've broken things that are very complex to a lot of people down into a simple format. And you've been doing this for a long time. And as a marketer, seeing your level of experience and your desire for innovation, but in a practical sense, really makes me appreciate you taking the time to join our show. Thanks, Ben. Thanks so very much. Okay, that wraps up this episode of the MarTech Podcast. Thanks again to Ron Jacobs, the founder of Jacobs Clevenger, for joining us. To learn more about Ron, you can click on the link to his LinkedIn profile in the bio in our show notes, or you could tweet him at Ron Jacobs, that's R-O-N-J-A-C-O-B-S, or you could visit his company's website, which is jacobsclevenger.com, J-A-C-O-B-S-C-L-E-V-E-N-G-E-R.com. If you didn't have a chance to take notes while you were listening to this podcast, don't worry, we've got you covered. Just head over to martechpod.com where we have summaries of all of our episodes and and the contact information for our guests. If you're a subscriber to the MarTech Podcast, thanks for being a member of our community. We always want to hear from you, so we created benjshap.com slash question where you can send us your marketing questions, which we'll answer live on our show. 
Of course, you can always reach out on social media. My handle is Ben J. Shap, that's B-E-N-J-S-H-A-P, on LinkedIn and on Twitter. And if you haven't subscribed yet and you want a weekly stream of marketing and technology knowledge in your podcast feed, we've got some great episodes lined up over the next few weeks. So hit the subscribe button in your podcast app and we'll be back in your feed sometime next week. Okay, that's it for today. But until next time, my advice is to just focus on keeping your customers happy. Thank you.